So let's look now at an event, a, a, a series of events over 14 days in October of 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And again, let's remember the big overarching question, which is how successful were US policies of containment? So the Cuban Missile Crisis is a time in history where many people believe that the world came closest to all-out nuclear war. You can see a contemporary cartoon of the time. On the left of the cartoon is Khrushchev uh, sitting on a, a nuclear weapon aimed at the USA and on the right is Kennedy also sitting on a nuclear weapon and their fingers are poised over the nuclear launch button and many people as I say believe that we, we were close at that time to a potentially disastrous, really for human society, nuclear conflict. Uh, by the way, just have a look at this cartoon. Would you think it's um, from the American side or from the Soviet side? Have a little look at it. Well, I don't know if you guessed, it's, it's an American cartoon and if you look at it, if you look at Khrushchev, he's clearly sweating more than Kennedy. Uh, and so this one is showing Kennedy as perhaps more resolute and not, not cracking as Khrushchev appears close to in this cartoon. Anyway, let's move on and look at the events of the crisis. So the background of the crisis, Cuba, a large Caribbean island, only 90 miles away from the United States, ruled by a corrupt dictator uh, in 1959 called Fulgencio Batista. He was corrupt, authoritarian, uh, rather unpopular, but he was supported by the USA because he was anti-communist. However, in 1959, there was a revolution and a man called Fidel Castro came to power and he gradually introduced a Soviet style government and looked more towards the USSR for support. So what happened between 1959 and something that we'll look at in a minute, the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961? Well, the relations were tense. The USA had actually supported the dictator Batista, who'd been overthrown by Castro, and they feared that Castro would be communist. So the relationship could be described as cold, frosty, but without any direct military confrontation between the armed forces of the USA and Cuba. Cuban exiles, these are people that had been part of uh, Batista's regime or had powerful business interests which were then overturned by the new regime. So Cuban exiles in the USA who had fled from Castro's rule, they did however form powerful pressure groups demanding action from the US government. Castro had also taken over some American agricultural businesses in Cuba and again this, although the USA was unwilling to get directly involved, the American business owners who'd had businesses taken away from them by the Cuban regime, they formed a powerful lobby group in Washington trying to persuade the USA to take a more direct line against Castro's regime in Cuba. Well, what happened next? The USA did ban the buying of sugar and banned all trade with Cuba in October of 1960. That was potentially disastrous for the Cuban regime because previously they'd been huge sugar exporters and the prime buyer of Cuban sugar had been the USA. So the hope there from the USA was to starve Castro's regime into submission. However, Khrushchev then stepped in and agreed to buy Cuban sugar at rather inflated prices. So this helped keep the Castro regime economically alive. Well, in January of 1961, the USA broke off all diplomatic relations with Cuba, really just unable to tolerate Soviet influence so close to the United States. Next, let's look at something called the Bay of Pigs invasion. The Bay of Pigs, by the way, is basically a bay called the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. And it's where there was an attempted uh, military takeover, uh, popular revolution against Castro. Let's look at some details about that. So the revolution of 1959 had been a blow to the USA, a communist state only 90 miles away. And in April of 1961, the CIA helped to organize. Now it's important to clarify, the CIA, the American Central Intelligence Agency, helped to train and organize an attack on Cuba, but no, there was no direct American military involvement. No US troops were involved. It was a force composed of Cuban exiles that had been trained and supplied 
by the CIA. And it was hoped that these Cuban exiles would land at the Bay of Pigs. There would then be a popular uprising and Castro would be overthrown. However, it was an embarrassing failure. Castro had in fact, was in fact rather popular with the people of Cuba, not like Batista had been. He'd also received warning about the invasion, and so the Cuban exiles were met by a far superior force of the Cuban army, um, and basically were basically arrested and overwhelmed. So it was an, a humiliating uh, defeat, a humiliating setback for Kennedy, as he had sponsored, through the CIA, this failed attempt to overthrow the Cuban regime, the Castro regime. So let's look at some background developments in the Cold War struggle. In 1962, the United States had placed missiles in Italy and in Turkey. And the range of these missiles meant that they could strike uh, large areas of the Soviet Union, including the capital, Moscow. Khrushchev then decided to place missiles in Cuba, which then would afford him uh, range, you know, long term range that could hit nearly every city in the continental United States. Well, this decision, particularly of Khrushchev's, turned out to be explosive. It sparked off the Cuban Missile Crisis. On the 14th of October, a U 2 spy plane took photographs of the missile site on Cuba. These photographs were then processed by the intelligence agencies and missiles were definitely identified. Soviet missiles were identified. And on the 16th of October, Kennedy was shown this incontrovertible, this definite proof of Soviet nuclear missiles on Cuba. Kennedy then had really four options. He could write a letter of protest. He could protest through the United Nations. This would register American disapproval with the missiles so close to the American mainland, but would not remove the missiles and could potentially look weak. He could bomb the missile sites. He could get his American bomber planes and bomb the missile sites. This would hopefully remove most of the missiles, but would nonetheless be obviously a direct act of war. It would be a surprise attack, which would also be rather immoral after all. The Americans had shown moral indignation over the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor in 1941. They could launch a military invasion of Cuba. Again, this is, this is what, clearly going to spark a war. You know, the, the Soviets could respond uh, with an invasion, perhaps, of, of Berlin or, or West Germany. So, again, a, a risky uh, to topic. It would definitely get rid of all the missiles, but very risky potential ramifications of Soviet invasions. Uh, he could do a naval blockade of Cuba. This would not remove the missiles, but would prevent any more missiles going in. And it would be perhaps a stronger action than just a letter of protest. So it's this last option that Kennedy chooses. They deliberately do not call it a blockade, though, because a blockade is technically an act of war. So the United States calls it a quarantine. A ring of American naval ships surround Cuba and they announce that they're going to search all incoming ships. They'll allow things like food, etc. into Cuba, but any ships containing nuclear missiles would be sent back. It was a very tense confrontation as a number of Soviet ships were bound for Cuba and appeared to be ignoring the quarantine, but did turn back on the 24th of October, just before the blockade. It was a very tense confrontation. Well, on the 26th of October, Kennedy received a letter from Khrushchev. And basically the letter said, we will withdraw missiles if you promise not to invade Cuba. Well, while the American administration is thinking about this, on the 27th of October, a second letter is received from Kennedy, from, rather, sorry, from Khrushchev to Kennedy. Now, this has changed. Instead of saying, we'll, you know, we'll withdraw missiles, he promised not to invade, it's, we'll withdraw, we will withdraw missiles from Cuba if you withdraw missiles from Turkey. Now, this second letter is alarming in a number of ways, uh, particularly some of the American uh, intelligence they believe that the, the quality of the letter, it looks like it's not coming from Khrushchev. They're worried there has been perhaps a, a military coup in the higher echelons of the Soviet government. Maybe Khrushchev has been overthrown and now hardliners are in power. 
in Moscow. They, they're not sure if the letter is actually from Khrushchev at all. So now what to do? Kennedy's in a real pickle here. He certainly doesn't want to spark off a nuclear war and probably Khrushchev doesn't want to do that either. However, he, he, he really is at risk of looking weak if he doesn't make the right decisions and allowing the Soviets to expand at the expense of America and the USA. So do they now withdraw missiles from Turkey? Well, they were considering this, but now with this um, basically quid pro quo, this offer from the Soviets in exchange, it looks like the Soviets are forcing the Americans to back down. In other words, you know, the Soviets are forcing the Americans to withdraw the missiles from Turkey in exchange for the Soviet withdrawal from Cuba. So it looked like backing down. Plans were being made, the military were drawing up plans for an invasion of Cuba and possibly even a nuclear missile strike in the USSR. It's not, not to say these would definitely happen, but the generals were drawing up these plans, so if, if Kennedy wanted to do them, the plans were there. And in fact, military leaders did recommend immediate airstrikes on Cuba. Well, what do they decide? Kennedy, together with his brother and this ex-con that he set up, this advisory committee, they decide to reply to Khrushchev's first letter, to ignore the second letter, which asks for a missile exchange, and just reply to the first letter, ask, you know, basically promising not to invade Cuba as long as the Soviets withdraw the missiles. So Robert Kennedy is then dispatched to meet the Soviet ambassador Dobrynin in the Soviet embassy in Washington and basically presents them with a the proposal. You know, we'll promise not to invade, if you remove the missiles, but you must remove the missiles by the next day or we will use force to destroy those missiles. There can be no official deal, but if Cuban missiles are removed, US missiles in Turkey will be removed soon after. So basically, through Dobrynin, this is what's called the back channel negotiation. They know that Dobrynin can, um, can relay this to Moscow very quickly and get a response. So the deal is, look, we will promise not to invade and we, it cannot be made public. This is a secret deal. But if you do remove the missiles, we will remove our missiles from Turkey. So on the 28th of October, Dobrynin reported back the Russians would remove their missiles from Cuba. So who was this a victory for? Was this a, a success for American containment, a victory for the Soviets or a victory for the world, perhaps it could be viewed as? Well, for Kennedy, certainly, it was seen as a victory. The deal over the missiles in Turkey being withdrawn was kept secret, so it did actually look like the Soviets had backed down rather than the Americans. For Khrushchev, although there was a lot of propaganda within the Soviet Union, and to some in the communist world, he did seem like a peacemaker, it was ultimately damaging to his reputation. Leading Soviets were angry that the USSR appeared to have climbed down, and a few years later, Khrushchev lost power in 1964. How about the Soviet allies, the, the communist Chinese? Well, they weren't impressed with Soviet performance. They thought that the USSR looked cowardly to be removing missiles and encouraged the Chinese to follow a more independent line from the Soviet Union. They certainly stopped seeing themselves in any way as a junior partner of the Soviets and yeah, were encouraged to pursue a more independent line. European allies of the USA were shocked at not being consulted uh, and not being seen as important by the United States. You know, France, Britain, etc. had not really been consulted in this. And de Gaulle, the president of France, actually pulled France out of NATO, the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it encouraged others in Europe to be more independent of US policy. It could also be seen as a victory for, for, for global peace. Both sides realised the danger of direct conflict and they were shocked at how close they had come to nuclear war. The Cold War did continue, but the USA and the USSR avoided direct hostility. There was a telephone hotline installed between Washington and Moscow <laughs> So there could be quick and direct communication between the leaders of the USA and the USSR in the event of any future hostile potential. So I hope you've uh, taken that on board and good luck with the quiz.